Hi everyone! I am Rebecca from Chemnitz and it is October 1st, 2020 and I'm filming an introduction for my Forsythia flower dyeing video. Now back in April and May the bushes behind me were covered in stunning yellow flowers that I harvested right at the end of the blossoming period to dye some yarn. Uh, I ended up popping back outside for this introduction because the Forsythias are actually turning a beautiful red color, which is a lot of fun. So although this doesn't have anything to do with today's video, I mean it kind of does because it's the same plant. <laughs> but let's now go back in time, look at my blooming Forsythias and talk about the color that we created with these bright yellow flowers. Gosh, these flowers are so beautiful. So now I'm going to start collecting some of these forsythia blossoms. I'm not going to worry if I get some of the green part on them from the stem. I'm just sort of going to go for it. I might pick up some of the blossoms that are littered around the ground as well. Um, but, oh my gosh, it's so heavy. I mean, I guess I can just grab a nice little handful <laughs> of these blossoms. And actually, let me see if I can focus on my hand. A nice little handful of these blossoms. And I'm just putting them all in this bin and we'll collect a lot. I, it's currently Thursday morning, so the cool vet warranting has been going on for about 48 hours. I actually have something else in my outside dye pot right now, so I don't think I'm gonna be able to try to extract this color today. So we might try to let the flowers dry a little bit to maybe do this weekend or early next week. But I thought it would be fun to try to start collecting them and see how much I could get. So the collection went a lot faster than I expected. Since I'm currently working on the eucalyptus, I can't go and start trying to extract color from this right now, but I don't think the flowers are quite done yet, so if I have to wait a couple days and re-harvest, it's not the end of the world. I did harvest all of this from shoots of my forsythia that I'm going to be pruning back anyway. And the nice thing about the way I found I could just sort of strip <laughs> the flowers off the leaves, it, or that I could just sort of strip the flowers off the stems, is that the leaf buds were actually pretty intact. So. That was really, really nice. Um, but anyway, you can see we got a massive amount of volume here. I think, gosh, hopefully it doesn't get too gross over the next day or so. I mean, ideally, if I would be able to set it up tonight, I would love to, but it's taking a long time for that dye pot to heat up to a boil. I think next time I absolutely should just boil water inside and have the hot plate on but bring the boiling water out to the pot so that way we're starting with something that is closer to the temp I want already versus waiting like two hours for it to come to temp. So anyway, uh, we'll be back when we're ready to play around with this a bit more. As for the flowers, they dried really, really nicely just sitting here in the garage. I think I'm gonna transfer this to another container and then go harvest more. It looked like a whole lot of flowers when wet, but dried, not as much. The other thing that I'd add is that any pigment that will degrade as the flowers dry likely would not remain on fiber. <laughs> it's mostly a hunch, but uh, I don't think there's an issue using dried product. Here are all the dried forsythia blossoms I gathered up. It does not look like very much anymore because they've dried. And the weight is gonna be less because also that since they're dry, that water has evaporated. The mesh bag I'm gonna use is about 11 grams. Placed all the blossoms in this mesh bag. Uh, it's technically, I think, a produce bag, and I will link to this in the video description. Think of it like a giant tea bag, because that is basically what we're going to be doing. We're going to be making some tea. So this is about 52 and a half grams, which means that we have about 41 and a half grams of dried forsythia blossoms. Here is my new electric hot plate. Uh, I just turned it on for the first time. Please, please, please let it work. <laughs> 
The burners are actually different sizes, and since this is a smaller pot, I have it on the smaller burner. I just filled up the pot with warm tap water, and then I added some boiling water from my kettle. Um, it is hot, so I don't really want to stick my hands in there. But like a giant tea bag, we are going to submerge this. And I need to go get some tongs. I'm a bit nervous that I can't tell if this little light is turned on yet or not. Uh, but <laughs> this is one of the reasons why I decided to start with water that's at least warm to give us a better shot of actually extracting some color this time. And you can see that from not even a whole minute, we already have some nice yellow color. Now, the big reason why I'm using the mesh bag is that way when we're ready to dye yarn or something, it's gonna be really easy because there's nothing to filter out. I will come and stir this periodically, but now I am gonna cross my fingers that this thing is actually working <laughs> because I did not test it yet. It has been about an hour and we're at a boil. Ooh, hot. Sorry for the sunlight, everyone. Uh, we are at a boil and we've got some great pigment. I am going to try without losing liquid to add a bunch to two jars. One where I'm going to put a mini skein with no mordant and the other where I am going to add a mini skein with mordant that I did a cool mordant a while ago. And we have approximately the same amount of liquid in each of these jars. And then to the one marked no, I am gonna add uh, 20 grams of some DK weight, 75% superwash merino, 25% nylon. And in the other pot, which unfortunately the yarn just fell on the floor, I have our skein that was treated with a mordant, an alum mordant. As for everything else in the pot, I'm gonna remove this ladle. And now I am going to remove our forsythia blossoms and set them aside. We might use them to extract more color in the future. Check out that dark color in the pot. All right, so now with the color that is left in the pot, I do want to add a, a full skein this is 100 grams of uh, Knit Picks Wool of the Andes Worsted Weight Yarn. It was treated with the alum mordant, and I'm hoping that we get a beautiful, beautiful golden color to it. Uh, so I've put that in the pot. There's not gonna be a lot of space to move around because I'm gonna add these two jars back in so that way they can be heated. Uh, along with the Wool of the Andes yarn. So you can see our setup. It's going to be sort of a double boiler with the yarn in there. And we're going to let this simmer for an hour. Once the temperature comes back up at least. But oh, 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 how I hope that yellow color we see remains in the yarn. Speaking of excitement, oh, that looks awesome. We are at a boil and it has been an hour. So I'm now going to turn off uh, my electric hot plate, which was working wonderfully. I will unplug it as well, and I'm gonna leave things to slowly cool down in it. I'm not sure how well you can see with the light and the shadows. Uh, I am curious. Yeah, there's a lot of pigment in here, but we have a nice, beautiful golden yellow. It is the next evening, and so now I am going to drain the container, and we can go inside and wash the yarn. I don't think that there's a lot you can tell at the moment from our no mordant versus our mordant yarn here, but there is a lot of pigment in here, at least with our mordanted mini skein. The first thing I wanna do is add a zip tie to our yarn that had the mordant treatment. That way we'll be able to tell the two apart. And right away, Oh, I think as I squeeze this, oh yeah. Oh, this made a big difference. There aren't many times when I could say it made a big difference to have the mordant there. There's been a handful, but I think this is the first time from, from material that I've harvested myself 
where I've seen a big difference. Uh, with the Mordant, we definitely got sort of this mustard yellow. Without, we've got a tan. This one looks a lot like tea dyeing, uh, using some kind of, maybe not black tea, which might give a little more yellow, but it, it feels like a little bit of tea color. That is striking. Awesome. As for the liquid, we see a difference in here too. The one where we had the mordant is significantly more yellow and a little bit more transparent. The water is a bit cloudier in the one that had no mordant treatment. Now, I'm not gonna double check the pH here, but there, so there is a chance that there could be some pH difference. I'm not testing the pH, but let's just, and that didn't change the color. That didn't really change the color. Okay, my non-specific splash of vinegar. Just curious, just curious. <laughs> but we're now gonna wash this along with our non-superwash 100% wool. And I will say, even with the separate containers, the superwash wool seems more pigmented than the non-superwash. That tends to be a pattern with natural dyeing. And I'm adding some clear dish soap. The container was just mostly empty, which is why it is so sudsy already. Uh, just so that way we can try to rinse out all of the extra pigment. And because I'm worried about tangles, I'm gonna add the one that had no mordant uh, in with the non-superwash wool, uh, just to, for safety. Now, my impressions right now, I think that this yellow color is fantastic. I don't know if I've gotten anything close to this before, and I am really, really excited. I was sort of hoping for this color with my dandelions, and the color that I got with that, uh, and well, you can go watch the video, but the color I got there is more greenish um, than what we see. And I'm not sure if it's because with the dandelions, there is a lot more um, green matter in there between the stems and like the greenery around the blossoms themselves. Whereas with the forsythia, there were really no leaves. Like the, what we gathered was predominantly the yellow blossoms. So again, I have no idea how much of a difference that really makes. Man, but I, I'm excited about this. And already, and this is probably something I'll talk about more in the dandelion video, but harvesting the forsythia was significantly easier than harvesting the dandelions. Because uh, it was just really easy to strip the blossoms from the twigs and didn't involve a lot of crawling around on the ground. <laughs> so I think between the two yellow flowers, hands down, I'm gonna say forsythia is the one to go for. But we don't know how many other factors are really important. And, you know, the quality of your tap water, uh, elements from how they were grown, there's many things that can probably uh, make some amount of difference here that I don't even really know. Again, I'm just a novice on this whole natural dyeing journey. But I'm going to keep rinsing this until I can get the water to either run clear or be a little more pale. And then uh, we will, well, let's just check on this one. It's already getting paler. Um, you can barely see it on camera, but I do want to do a few more rinses. Uh, and then I'll put it through the spin dryer and hang the yarn up to dry. And scent wise, like maybe it smells slightly like tea, but it does not smell. I, I'm really excited. I think this is like the best result I've ever had with something I've picked myself. Here is the dry forsythia yarn. And I am so, so, so excited with this beautiful mustard color we got when we used the alum mordant. The yarn that didn't have the mordant is still a pretty color. It's sort of a soft beige. There's less yellow. It's a yellowish beige, but it is definitely nowhere near as close to where we had the mordant. And I don't know about you, but I was really, really excited with this result. I feel like sometimes adding the mordant into the equation 
can create a dramatic result in the hue or the amount of saturation that we get, but sometimes it's a little underwhelming. And this time, the mordant really helped. And that cool vat technique to mordant the fibers was perfect. Like this does not feel felted at all. It also didn't feel slimy, uh, which maybe it was the black beans where I felt like the yarn felt slimy, but the integrity of the fibers feel great. And it was so much easier to do that I know I wanna do that method going forward. In this video, I referenced another natural dyeing video that I was working on at the same time a few times. And that was dyeing yarn with dandelions. Ultimately, there's a lot very, very similar about this, but the yellow that we got from the forsythia is a beautiful mustard yellow and it is more true. And I will talk more about the dandelion in that video, but I think between the two yellow springtime flowers, uh, I would go for the forsythia again in the future. And in fact, I'm already thinking for when my bushes bloom next year, so that way I can do it again. It is definitely hard to tell from looking at this yarn, but it is a bit of a semi-solid versus a true solid. There are some tonal variations to the yarn. It's just with lighting, it's sometimes hard to tell if it's actually a huge difference or a difference from the way light is hitting the yarn. And so I think that you will see a little bit of variation with the knitting of this yarn, but oh, the color is so beautiful. As for our 75% Superwash Merino, 25% Nylon DK yarn versus our 100% Peruvian Highland Wool yarn, there is a bit of a hue difference. Like there's definitely more pigment here in the Superwash wool. But since those were dyed in mason jars, the proportion of the amount of pigment to the amount of yarn might not be the same. And I cannot tell, say with any certainty that the ratio of pigment was higher for the mini versus the full skein or vice versa, because I don't have an accurate measurement of the total volume that we created. So therefore, I can't make an extremely definitive conclusion that we get more pigment on the superwash wool, but, uh, given the results that we've seen with natural dyeing thus far, across the board, I have seen more pigmentation on uh, superwash yarn versus non-superwash, and that is the reality. So therefore, I'm comfortable saying that this aligns with that trend. Nevertheless, I am thrilled that we got something this pigmented out of uh, a natural dye on a non-superwash yarn. I think it's amazing. For some color contrast, here is the skein of uh, Stroll Fingering Weight Yarn, which is actually the same fiber content of this that we did with Eucalyptus with no mordant right away. Um, so that really helps show off how pigmented uh, the yellow is. And then here is, I didn't have a bare wool of the Andes on hand, but this is bare, I think, gloss, just to show the natural bare color to again, show off just how much more pigment we did get overall. I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and I really hope you enjoyed this video. I am so excited to do more natural dyeing. If you wanna check out the other natural dyeing projects I have tried, I do have a playlist of all these videos so you can easily find them in one place. I absolutely still consider myself a novice when it comes to natural dyes, but I am learning a lot and I'm excited to explore even more. If you enjoy these videos, please subscribe and turn on your notifications so you never miss a new video. And go ahead and leave a comment below and let me know what natural dyes you think I should explore. If you're already a fan of Chemnitz, you should consider checking out the Chemnitz Patreon. Uh, I offer a lot of cool perks, including early access to new content, some behind the scenes sneak peeks, and well, from this video, there are actually a couple behind the scenes live streams that you can go check out because once you become a Patreon, uh, you can go and look at all the archives of behind the scene things that I have shared along the way. You can find links to the Patreon and other places you can find me in the video description. Thank you so much for watching.